Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Cameras and Coffee. In today's video, we're going to talk about two seemingly unrelated things that are not, I don't think, all that unrelated in actuality. F11 lens mania and the future of lens design as AI becomes more prevalent in the space. But first, All right, for today's coffee, I am enjoying from Mills Coffee Roaster in Rhode Island, which I believe is the oldest coffee roaster in the US, the Monsoon Masala, a, uh, yeah, that's right, a, a coffee from India that is, oh. Bitter. <sighs> wow. Ooh. Sorry. I, that is so bitter. I just saw through time. Oh my gosh. Okay. So, uh, before we get going, of course, I'm curious to hear your thoughts about both of the subjects we're going to talk about in this video today. We're going to jump right in with two interesting lenses. If you saw my unboxing video yesterday for this one, this is the 70 millimeter Camlan f11 weighs in it quite a chunky 814 grams uh so ridiculous uh anyway 70 millimeter is gonna have to be pretty big on f11 so i will say having used this now once just once so far and that's where those sample photos and the unboxing came from the guards on the front of this lens here do affect, uh, obviously it stands to reason they change the shape of the entrance pupil. They affect the, the shape of the out of focus area characteristics, wide open, not pleasing. So I'm going to try and take those off uh, today before I use this lens again. Uh, anyway, and then this other one here from Camlan, also the 32 millimeter F11, which I, I haven't taken any sample photos with but I've looked through viewfinders with it and it is um, a smaller image circle than the 70 millimeter. Wide open, the 70 millimeter darn near covers full frame. And if you're okay with a little bit of vignetting in your images, it is totally usable on full frame wide open, which makes it an incredibly interesting portrait lens for full frame shooters, as well as APS-C and micro four thirds shooters. Although you really get some staggeringly good out of focus area characteristics with that at the wider apertures on full frame. So, but how does this relate to AI? Well, I've been working on the August round glass review video scripts, and I'm going to finish the one for the 31 millimeter FA limited tonight, which is uh, right. The last section I have to write is the review, and then I'll be working on the one for the, tw the Sony 20 millimeter 28. Both of them are stunningly good lenses. And I've always thought of the 31 millimeter as being technically perfect, but it's not. And I've added a section, the 31 millimeter, uh, the 20 millimeter, if my a7 IV comes back from repair soon enough, but at minimum, the 31 millimeter is going to be the first video I do with introducing a new section into the art round glass reviews called the Zytel analysis. And basically what that's gonna do is look at lens performance and what that tells us about the way that some of the optical flaws are or are not corrected. And shockingly, as I did this cital analysis on the 31 millimeter, I found that it has some astigmatism and some coma. But like, if you're a Pentax fan, you know that the 31 millimeter is widely regarded as being the best general purpose lens ever made for the system and it is, if not ever made, period. But looking at it, there's, oh, and there's also some mechanical vignetting of the out of focus area characteristics built into the lens's housing on that lens, which is evidenced by the cat's eye shape of the wide open out of focus area source point lights. And um, so as I'm looking at this and, and there's, there's, pr there's, there's things like there's a little bit of color fringing in the very middle and then there's some out of focus, there's some coma and astigmatism in the corners. It gets, it's not bad, but it's there. I started thinking about, well, what would 
like a technically perfect lens look like and how would it be made? And it occurred to me that if someone sat down and they typed into their AI, pro AI lens designing program, give me a perfect lens that is 31 millimeters f1.8, that the limited would not be that lens because of those, those three issues, right? But it's an amazing lens. And I started thinking about the fact that what it is that has been shown in the round glass review series that, as it's been going on now for almost two years on a regular basis, is that what really creates the interesting and appealing elements of lens image characteristics are the flaws the imperfections in those lenses. And as I go back and I've been using older lenses, I have uh, picked up some, I, I've been using a, a Goers 12 inch F55 seller. It's a hundred years old right now. Literally it was made in 1923 and it's in a volute shutter from 1923 and it still works. Stunning image character, far from perfect. <laughs> uh, really, really lovely performer. Um, picked up a Schneider Dasikar from 1928. Looking forward to using that as soon as I get it mounted in a way that I can do that. Yeah, but, but looking at the image character on, a, uh, on the, the it, uh, Intrepid 8x10 ground glass, really captivating image with shockingly terrible corners. So, but they add to it. So as I was thinking like, all right, so we got this F11 lens, right? These two F11 lenses. Lenses that, let's say 10 years ago, five maybe, probably could not have been designed in the same, with the same performance that these have. I haven't evaluated this one, but the 70 millimeter has really good performance. And, and looking at, you know, I've, I've so far only used it on a 12 megapixel Sony a7S II full frame. But looking at the images from that, it's really good. I cannot wait to see how it holds up on the a7 IV. The parts are back, or are finally in stock, so it's getting repaired right now. Um, anyway, so, so those lenses probably five years ago, maybe even three years ago, couldn't have been designed. That's my best guess, at least not as they are now. Yes, there have been F1.2 and 1.0 and 0 0.95 lenses over the years, but they do not perform up to the standards of equivalently aged 1.4, 1.8, and 2.0 lenses of the same focal length. So, and a big part of that is because of the, the complex lens, you know, optical glass types and shapes needed to correct image characteristics at lenses when they're shot wide open. And let's face it, if you're getting a super fast lens, you're going to shoot it wide open. I did not buy that 70 millimeter F11 so I could lock the aperture ring at F11, I promise. It, kind of falls apart that far stop down. Uh, I'm so glad they did not have that stop down to 16 or 22 because the image quality would not be there. Um, anyway, but as I was thinking about like, what is, what is it that has changed? And of course, computers have gotten more powerful. And every, we see like since the period after World War II in the 1950s, old surplus military computers were, were bought by the lens designers for use in lens calculation assistance. And so you'd still have these lens designers who went from doing the calculations on paper with slide rules and things like that to using computer assistance so that better calculations could be developed more quickly by the same people and improved lens designs could be, could be put out, right? And, and those computer programs have continually gotten more and more powerful. I envision a day not too terribly far in the future because let's face it, optical design is math. Computers do math very well. It's what they were built for and it's what they are very advanced at doing. And I envision a, a time in the not distant, distant future where there will be some very, very advanced AI where a, a, an optical engineer can type in the specs that they want, the you know focal length, maximum aperture, register distance, or angle of view, things like that. Different, and, and you could even envision a, a design, an, an optical uh, design AI that could take other characteristics into parameter: amount of vignette or light loss at the corners, image circle size, uh, out of focus image characteristics 
source point, um, the, the diffraction star characteristics based on the shape of the aperture, things like that. What an AI could develop in a matter of seconds or minutes with being given a set of parameters to build to would take a team of engineers months or years. I think that's a huge, and if, if no one is developing an AI to do that right now, I would be absolutely shocked. I have to imagine there is probably in both the consumer and the private side, the uh, industrial high-end optical development fields, an arms race right now to see who can first, who can develop the best lens design AI the fastest. In the consumer marketplace, I'm certain it's going to be Canon or Sony. But um, at any rate, can you, can you imagine what this is going to do for lens design? This, is, this would allow anyone to design a lens effectively and quickly. If you have, so, so what do I think, where do I think this is headed? Lens, lens construction could, with a very, very good 3D printer that can 3D print glass, and if, or even I guess you could probably do this with clear acrylic, could potentially be done at home. Not to the same quality, don't get me wrong. But um, this, something like this would allow someone with an idea for how a lens could or should perform to create a design. For consumer lenses, you know, for those, you and I, who are sitting around and uh, doing, doing photography with consumer lenses, honestly, I think what we'll see are better lenses coming to market more quickly. And by better, I mean more technically perfect, which quite frankly means more image sterility and sameness. We'll get to that in a sec. Honestly, where this worries me is in things like drone and satellite optics, because those are already, if you've ever used Google Earth and seen the aerial photos that put that together, those are amazing. I can see the shadows of people on hiking trails when I'm planning out a hike on Google Earth. Uh, I got to imagine that what isn't public in that space is even better, right? So that's a very scary area of this development because in those spaces, you want a technically perfect lens. You want something that has no aberrations, no coma, no astigmatism, things like that be from corner to corner. You want a perfectly flat MTF chart at the very top of the, you know, very flat MTF line at the very top of the chart because that's the job of those lenses. You don't want that for consumer lenses. That's something I think that Zeiss at least has been very aware of. And if I'm using a Zeiss lens right now, and it's always a joy for me to use these because wide open they vignette a lot, right? And creates a very stunningly gorgeous image characteristic. And as I was looking at the 31 millimeter, I'm thinking, man, this is like a perfect lens. I'll bet this is gonna blow this dot chart test out of the water. And it by and large did, but not to the same extent as the 100 millimeter 2.8 macro. But um, as I was looking at it, I realized this corner astigmatism and coma and the central uh, lateral or sag sagittal chromatic aberration that it's showing uh, really do a lot to contribute to the way that the lens performs. Consumer photographic lenses don't benefit from perfection. So my, my, my big fear about an AI system that can develop perfect lenses very quickly, well, it's twofold, like we talked about. It's, it's, you know, if you live in a surveillance state, that's something to be worried about. But if you enjoy photography and if you enjoy having lenses which add to the images you want to create, I could see a world where that's completely lost. Like, if we, what is perfection? There is a single definition for perfection. It's that MTF chart with the perfectly flat line at the very top of it. If every lens is perfect, every lens will perform in the exact same manner. What separates the lenses that we use are their imperfections. I got in a lot of trouble during my graduate program one day because I wrote a line in one part of my master's thesis, which was a, a, the, my first novel. I think it was either my first novel or one of my short stories, I forget which. And the line was something to the effect of, um, imperfection is the playground of beauty. 
And the, the, my classmates went ballistic. They're like, no, this is, this is such nonsense. It is actually not nonsense. There's a single definition of perfection and our deviations from those, from that definition of perfection is what creates uniqueness. And uniqueness, I, I would argue, is definitely connected to beauty. So if you really want to create beautiful images, what we're talking about isn't just creating a landscape image or a portrait or whatever, it's creating a unique image. Perfection's not unique. If everything is perfect, everything is the same, there's nothing unique about that. So at any rate, uh, I do think that the advent of AI is going to spur a race towards ever faster lenses. Air limits the aperture of a lens, air, air diffraction, to zero, f0.3. Could we be looking at 50 millimeter f0.3 lenses in a couple of years, three to five years? That wouldn't shock me. Is it 0 0.3 or 0 0.5? I think it's 0 0.5. I think it's f0.5. Um, I think you can achieve f0.3 if you have a, a different medium between the rear element and the, the sensor plane, if I remember correctly. Um, so I think it is f5, f0.5. Someone's going to correct me. I'm going off memory here. If I'm, someone's going to correct me in the comments. But at any rate, are we going to get to a point in the future where, in the very near future, where, where standard lenses are as fast as the atmosphere of our planet will allow them to be? I think that's a distinct possibility, yeah. I think we're getting there. So um, that, that actually kind of is sad to me because I think if we have a bunch of near-perfect lenses that are ultra-fast, photography is going to get very boring just as fast as those lenses are. So thank you everybody for watching, and I'll see you in the next Cameras and Coffee.